time that you kind of feel you want to stop uh, and then we can take a pause and then we can restart. No, the... no problem. No, I'm, I'm OK. okay. Go ahead. Uh, and then the other, only other thing, just for my interest, was did you actually travel on the Windrush or was it a different oh, ship? No, 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 not, no, not me. Um, no, I came, I came as a boy in the 1960s, but my friend Sam King uh -huh. is the one who originated the whole idea. OK, cool. Yes, All right. His idea. <laughs> so he got me involved. All right. So, um, whenever you're ready, uh, Sam, uh, sorry, Arthur, I'm sorry. Yes, I, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready when you're ready. Uh, I start uh, asking those questions. Okay. Cool. So, come traveling over to England or the motherland, what were some of your first memories of uh, this country, please? Well, not having traveled abroad before and coming into um, a large capital, because I came to London in the 60s as a boy, um, it's about the number of people, the, the, the buildings, <laughs> um, buildings looking like factories and so on. So those are the first impressions immediately. And then the, later on, the cold. But uh, I didn't come in a cold uh, month. I came in July, so it was in the winter. So th those were the first impressions. And uh, was England as cold as you were led to believe back home? <laughs> well, one never thought, thought about the cold. I mean, whenever you think about cold in the Caribbean, it's sort of an evening breeze. That's right. And you put on a, you know, maybe some kind of a, a cardigan or whatever you can you can get. But um, that's kind of cold we thought about. But then we also um, heard about snow. Ah, so, okay. so in that sense, um, one can't tell, you know, how how cold snow is. So, sure. it's a matter of, you know, um, a surprise when winter comes and uh, then then <laughs> problems arise. <laughs> and if you don't mind me asking, what were your first uh, experiences of snow when you saw well, it? Well, my, my first fe um, my first thing was, I mean, obviously I was I was a boy, and uh, I remember um, the cold and touching the cold and throwing it up in the air, that type of thing. But, um, you know, it's like every person who hasn't experienced cold, whether young or old, really, you know, just curiosity. It, you know, it looks like snow. It looks like, sorry, it looks like uh, cotton wool coming down from the sky. <laughs> <laughs> so those things are, you know, just ordinary stuff, really. <laughs> so, uh, if you don't ask me, what year did you come to the UK? I came in 1961. 1961. Okay, the yeah, one, and um, I came to my uncle. Um, the idea was to study, obviously, and um, I was on my own, which is a, a quite a, quite a, a thing, really, of, of a boy. And uh, you know, uh, my uncle was in this country, let's say, in 1959, I think. So let's say two years. Okay. So he was also getting into the swing of a, a new country. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, uh, you know, we had to learn how to live in London. Yeah. Uh, together, you know, so sure. uh, he, he wasn't the only family member. There was another family member who came along um, and that's completely separate. I mean, we didn't even know he was around. Oh, um, okay. and, uh, so in that sense, we never met him until many, many years after. Oh, so, OK. So those are the early impressions. But like, like I said to you earlier, um, uh, that, um, you know, my involvement with what's going on now with Windrush is something that I had to learn. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I learned those things. <laughs> okay. and, and in terms of learning those things, can I just ask something? And the reason why I ask this is you came over in 61. Uh, uh, my mother came over in 1960. My father came over in 61. Uh, and one of the things talking to them was a really strong sense of the royalty, the Queen, the impact that that had on some of the Commonwealth and Caribbean uh, countries. Did that have any particular resonance for you and your family? Not at all. No, no. I think it was just an ordinary scenario with the Queen, respect for the Queen, respect for royalty, respect for people in authority. There was no, there was no big thing. Okay, cool. Okay, so um, 
You said that you came over, you had some families uh, here in uh, England. Yeah, in, in, um, in London mainly. <laughs> in London. Yeah. So, uh, what was your first job, please, Arthur? The first job I had was a job um, doing all kinds of different things, uh, uh, especially because I was unemployed and getting national assistance. In those days, it was called national assistance, and then it was changed to social security and all these fancy names. Um, so I had various jobs, really. <laughs> uh, one of the jobs I had, and I was explaining that to somebody a couple of days ago, um, I, I had a job to, uh, to sweep snow. Sweep? <laughs> <laughs> So you imagine the sweeping snow uh, um, and you're unemployed, you have to ha get a job. But of course, that job didn't, you know, I, I didn't stay very long in that job. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so in that sense, you know, um, those are my, my experience of snow anyway. <laughs> All right. So you yeah. hadn't seen it and then you ended up cleaning it. <laughs> Clear it. Yeah. Clearing it. Yeah. On the road. Yeah. On the road. So for the council. <laughs> OK, cool. Yeah. And and. Yeah, um, what are your kind of experiences of some of like the kind of peculiarities of British life? So things like fish and chips, um, armpit bread. I don't know if you come across that. My, my parents are quite fond of telling me about that. What were you uh, fish and chips? About? Well, I, I I was never a uh, a favourite of fish and chips really, <laughs> although I, I used to see people um, taking it, especially on Fridays. Yeah, um, and often it was in at a newspaper or just ordinary paper, mm -hmm. uh, brown paper, and uh, that was it, like a, like a ritual. Friday was Friday evening was fish and chips evening. Okay, <laughs> from what I remember, but I was never involved in it. <laughs> and what about armpit bread? Did you hear that? No, no. Again, you know, I mean, um, I have to say that uh, because of my uncle, my uncle wasn't the best of cooks, and you know, and that kind of thing. So. Um, in that sense, I don't remember these favourite, um, you know, meals as such or whatever. <laughs> no. So uh, people like my parents called it armpit bread because um, you used to get the bread fresh from the bakery and there would be no wrapping or pa uh, packaging. But often the, the men would put it underneath their armpits and would walk home uh, with it. So, yeah, that was um, that was. I'd say my uh, one of my parents' strongest um, <laughs> memories in terms of that. Um, you said that your job was with the council, kind of sweeping snow. Um, how were you received by the workforce? The truth really is, I don't remember it. It uh, um, remember all the details, but I doubt whether I, I, I had gone into the office with um, with, with people in, in the office or. Whatever. Uh, so I don't I remember just being on the road with other people. And right. that was it. So it wasn't an any interaction. I mean, one has had to get on with sleeping snow. I mean, not talking, you just get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no conversation. So, so in that sense, no interactions to talk about. Yeah, sure. OK. Uh, and then after you said, because you said you didn't last that long with the that council. So what was then your next job? As I said, I had various jobs. That's the thing, you know. I had jobs in factories to do with um, with uh, clothing. One place I went to uh, a Jewish company to do with, um, I, I think, uh, not, not sewing on uh, buttons and so on, but to do with to do with clothing, uh, fa factory work. Uh, another job was to do with packing. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so it's, you know, in those days, you, you got a job easily. You see, yeah, and and, they, and therefore you know there was no big no big no big issue really. Sure. So given you know how easy it was to get a job back then, what do you think about now? And we kind of briefly talked about think the impact of COVID. What do you think about the job situation now for young people given this global pandemic? Well, the jobs are going to be more difficult um, to find because uh, uh, our people are. At the lower end in terms of jobs, uh, whether it's in the factory, whether um, supermarket, um, okay, Tesco is doing well. I don't think Tesco is laying off many people, but um, there are other jobs that are actually um, losing losing people. 
Mm -hmm. uh, uh, many, many thousands will be un unemployed uh, soon. And I think that's the problem with uh, uh, a, a black, black people, African, um, Asian people, uh, getting jobs and being in those jobs, and especially African and African Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, many of them are qualified and they don't get the jobs that they deserve uh, and so on. And uh, that's a very big issue. So it's serious, especially with COVID. Um, COVID hasn't helped and win, uh, wouldn't help. But we would hope that they would get together and um, mobilize, I would say, um, you know, do things for themselves. Yes. You know, provide um, employment for themselves, self-employment. The main thing is being ambitious. Right. Yeah, and that's the key word, being ambitious. Oh, more opportunities um, there are now than there were of self-employment years ago. Yeah. Okay, and in terms of on that basis of the ambition, what role do you see education and institutions like Queen Mary uh, playing in contributing to young people's ambitions? Well, education is key um, in all aspects of it, uh, whether it's education in terms of university education, um, apprenticeship, um, getting involved, uh, learning. Learning is key, learning at any level higher level, um, the better. And therefore, Queen Mary and, and, and other colleges um, have a commitment uh, to teach, uh, to help youngsters to learn and to go and get the, the big, well, you know, the best jobs that they can. So mm. universities, uh, colleges are, are crucial. And I would, you know, encourage every black person, African, Caribbean, Asian, to go for it. You know, be educated as, as long. I mean, even, you know, to, to ages into the 90s. Oh, good. Never, yeah. think, never, never think that you will ever uh, not want to learn. Yeah. Excellent. Now, that's a really wonderful uh, message. And my kind of final question is, because you've seen obviously a lot of life, uh, Arthur. Um, and now, if you don't mind me saying, you know, we see you as a living legend, you know, somebody from the Caribbean who came and made major contribution to the development of this uh, country. How would you like to be remembered? And what message would you, in addition, want to give to uh, young people, uh, black and white? Indeed, I would think that um, in my scenario, uh, it is to do with uh, being being an activist. Okay. I think being an activist in terms of bringing about change, working to bring about change, um, knowing where um, and knowing how to get involved in the community, serving the community, and being a person who um, is seen to be, you know, seen to be one who wants to bring about change. I think change changed in terms of, we talk about educational change, um, about um, uh, you know, ethnic minority, changes in the community, social change, uh, political change. You know, it's about change. It's about bringing about change and doing the very, very best for the community and ensuring that that change does happen. In other words, even, you know, uh, being, being a, a, a person who is so committed um, you know, to do it, yeah. showing yeah. enthusiasm, you know, and, 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 you know, serious commitment. Brilliant. So, Arthur, thank you very much for giving up your time and sharing your experiences, uh, Windrush memories uh, with us here at Queen Mary. And can I wish you continued success and uh, thank you for everything you've done so far and thank you for your encouragement for us to keep going and to be active in bringing about change in uh, our country thank you very much indeed okay it's a pleasure always a pleasure thank you thank you and jill we will if we can we can jill just wants to come in or uh, uh yeah Okay. Sure. Yeah, thank okay. you. That was really useful. Can okay. I just ask you a question about the foundation? Okay. Uh, because we haven't said anything about that. Maybe something about 
why you got involved with that and how you see your activities actually developing and raising the profile of some of the injustices that have been done to that generation of people. Okay, now uh, the first thing is to say that I met a man by the name of Sam King, mm. right? Samuel Beaver King. And I think that, again, he was my mentor um, going back to what 1983 when he was the mayor he was the mayor of Southwark, the first black mayor of Southwark. that's right i met him then and uh, from then onwards you know until he passed away in 2016. so you're looking at a man who had vision a man who served king and country in the war who returned to jamaica because he was forced to return actually to jamaica uh demobbed uh but return uh six months later on the empire wind rush and um Interestingly enough, he kept the names of dozens of men and women on that ship. The only person I reckon kept the names, apart from the ship's log, the ship passenger list. Well, he was the second passenger list, um, you know, lister, in the sense that he kept the names of um, hundreds. Uh, well, I can't say hundreds, but I, I, he, gave, he gave me a list. And he would send them postcards every year, and he kept in touch with them until 1988, when he had the first Windrush commemoration, 40 years after Windrush. That's never been done, right? And then in 1995, he said to me, look, um, we should start something to commemorate the 50th anniversary, which was in 1998. And that's what we did. And that was, the, and that was a commencement, you know, of, of a journey or, or a story of journeys of people who came on the ship, you see, as young men. Most of those people who came were young. You know, in the early 20s, you see, and he was 22 when he came. And when he served in the war, he was about 17 or, or, or so. But the main point there is that an influence like Sam King is, is what's driven the Windrush Foundation, you know, to move on and lead in terms of uh, Windrush being something that those of us from the Caribbean, whether African Caribbean, Asian Caribbean, Chinese Caribbean, because they were all on the ship. Uh, as well, not only African Caribbean. So in that sense, I see Sam King as a visionary. And, not those, and that's, that's the kind of memory that I would want to have of him. And even now with this the scandal um, in 2018, when it, uh, it, it was actually um, sort of like you know, burst out as such. Um, in that sense, this whole thing about when Rush Generation is an idea of Sam King, right? Sam King died in 2016, but he was the one who like invented or created the word, with, you know, many many years ago. So when we hear about the generation, it's not just about this generation here. It's about the men and women who came in 1948. So that's a long answer, but I'm afraid to give you a good background uh, for Sam King. I think that's about that's about it, really. Mm. Thank you. Brilliant, yeah. Um, you were also talking about your early experiences when you arrived here and some of the different jobs that you've done. Was was there any time where you ever felt you'd made a mistake or you shouldn't have come or you didn't achieve what you would hope to achieve by coming here? Can you say a little bit more about your actual experiences, how you felt and and how you actually felt about because you know coming over as a boy on your own leaving your family that's that's a big decision isn't it and coming to a cold country that's got that's snow right. That's right. <laughs> i think most people who came um within the next within the first like six six months did feel um that they made a mistake um because of the cold and the indifference of the population and, and so on uh but i think that that is natural if you're accustomed to a small country um, and a close-knit family. Um, that's always the case, you see. But a lot of people, um, you know, didn't, didn't return. Some people did return um, because of money, because of finance. Mm. You couldn't raise that particular money uh, quickly enough uh, to, you know, to, to return home. So, yes, most people, including myself, did feel that, you know, a, a mistake was made. But as you, the time went on, you know, uh, one forgot about that. Mm. 
thank you. Yeah. And what do you think were the things that helped you get over that that sort of culture shock and that feeling of making a mistake? What what were the things that helped you to feel as though this could become your home? Well, I think a determination to succeed. I think a determination to make um, good of life, um, to improve, um, to get involved in the community, because those are the days when uh, the black community, um, especially the Caribbean community, had to survive, had to come together. Um, mm. to, you meet a lot of people uh, in that situation, you talk about life, and um, there's a solidarity. You know, you meet people like yourself, and therefore it, it had to work. So you had to work, and therefore one was a part of that operation uh, to make it work. Well, thank you. Um, uh, probably just the final question, really. Um, you talked about the importance of education, and I absolutely agree with you on that. Could you say a little bit more about that, about the type of education you received when you came here? What were the good things about it? Uh, what were maybe the challenges? Can you say just a little bit more about um, how education has worked for you or maybe some of the issues that you encountered? Well, because um, education was crucial, I mean, um, uh, I, I, I eventually um, had to attend evening classes. Um, in, in, in those days, a university education wasn't easy. Um, that it, well, I shouldn't say easy. It's easy now, <laughs> um, but in term in, ter in terms of what was available, uh, and what at what one uh, what wanted to wanted to do, um, I wanted to become a teacher at one at one point, and um, I, I applied um, to um, Avery Hill College, and so on. And um, that was in the six that was in the seventies, you know. And they turned me down. You see, in in the sense that those are the days when we would talk about black 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 teachers. And when you, in your application, you know, present a narrative, you know, as a black person, you'd want to contribute to education, that was not liked. So one had to avoid um, writing those things on an application form. But I didn't. I know I talked about, you know, bringing about, you know, uh, changes in terms of uh, black achievement and stuff. So th those are the days you couldn't say those things and get by. You can say it now, but you can't. <laughs> you couldn't then. <laughs> so education um, was important then. It's important now, um, and the young people have a, an opportunity beyond you know the older generation, beyond you know to, to achieve, to go as far as you can, you know to to raise uh, the funds and and so on, get on get on with life. And we've come to the stage now where not only do we encourage people to think about history from a multiplicity of perspectives, we've actually got a whole month to celebrate Black History, which Indeed. of course is while we're here. That's right. I mean, Black History Month is now very commonplace. Uh, people uh, often say, well, you know, uh, why have just one month? But then they forget that Black History continues throughout the year. Definitely. Really, yeah. and, and will continue. But to have a special month is no problem. You know, no. there are many people who I know and, and who I who whom I knew, you know, didn't like it <laughs> um, and wrote articles about it. But I think that it's here to stay. You know, I mean I visit schools and um, the young people they love it. You know, they, they you know, and it's both black and white, you know, Asian, you know. So for them it's like a festival, you know, you, you have things happening. <laughs> so yeah. in that sense, Black History Month is here to stay. Yeah. I think, though, that um, with lots of pressure to actually um, diversify the curriculum, hopefully there will come a time where black history will be every month. So we won't so much need a particular focus. We will have actually embedded it to the extent that we all recognise that history is not just about one perspective. Yeah, but more than that, you know, at the moment, at Key Stage 4, which is our GCSE level, there is um, in the curriculum uh, a subject called uh, migration, emp uh, empire, migration, oh, yeah. and people. Yeah. And therefore, it all depends on the teachers. So this yeah. is challenge um, is for teachers. It's a yeah. massive challenge, black and white and Asian, because yeah. they are the ones now responsible. No excuse now that it's not in the curriculum. No, absolutely. For that to be studied, empire, you know, people, yeah. you know, migration and so on. Yeah. 
and so it's all year, as you said, it, it can it can be yeah. all year if, te if teachers want it. Yeah, and I noticed on your website you had some great resources to support that module. So a little plug for that. If anybody hasn't seen those, they looked amazing, actually. Yeah, so, indeed. yeah, a Windrush, definitely. one of the great things the Windrush Foundation are doing to support that development in terms of education. Absolutely. So right. thank you for that as well. Oh, pleasure. Thank All you, right. Sam. Okay. Lawrence, over to you. So I've got nothing more to say and to add. And Jill, thanks for your questions. It's really kind of thank you, Sam, for sharing your time and your awesome. memories. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. <laughs> Anytime, call me again. I'm here. <laughs> but you take it easy then. Right? All the best. Okay. Really grateful to you for your time and yes. for everything that the foundation does. Okay. And we okay. will no doubt be asking you to get involved, maybe even not during Black History Month, because Anytime. we're hoping to start making this much more of a regular thing. So right, right, thank right. you so Anytime, much. I'll be happy to continue. Brilliant. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Arthur. Oh.